I have seen a very stimulating talk before, and Mihai, Jan, and Bart have actually alluded uh, to, a, to the common problems and challenges of the diseases uh, we want to tackle, and also about the ideas how, how to overcome them. So I am um, um, one of the rare species of, uh, of a physician scientists, and I think they are more and more dying out uh, recently, and I think that's also a challenge for life research in the future. So we have to uh, try to basically intermingle much more uh, clinics and molecular uh, sciences in uh, inflammation and in other fields of uh, disease. So I want to ha I have 20 minutes of uh, immune inflammatory diseases, and I want to give you a kind of a 10,000 miles overview where the field has uh, developed and what are the key challenges at the moment. Uh, so the inflammatory response is um, crucial to us. It's actually a physiological response. Whenever you burn yourself, you cut yourself, and you have an infection, you have to overcome this problem by an inflammatory response. But at the other hand, you have to also resolve the inflammatory response. And it's a very tightly regulated process, because otherwise we would go all get inflamed forever and we would die early um, uh, when we wouldn't resolve infl inflammatory responses. Uh, there are several factors, crucial factors, which are make uh, an inflammatory response to an inflammatory disease. One is autoimmunity, as you see here. One is genetics, uh, and the other one is barrier dysfunction. Um, and uh, if inflammation uh, becomes chronic, you um, uh, develop these kinds of diseases, usually at the uh, inner, outer surfaces of the body, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, asthma, but also psoriasis are the typical features. They come early in life, they are very chronic, and they destroy the tissues. They have a huge impact on the life quality of the individual patients, but also for the, for the healthcare system, because usually treatment has to be uh, given lifelong, uh, and there is yet no cure in these kind of conditions. So when you look at the textbook, uh, we still live in the Stone Age, uh, I would say, of inflammatory diseases. You see these galaxies here in colors. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the vessel galaxy, the joint galaxy, gut ga galaxy, skin, lung, eye. So they are in all the hospitals in the world. These are usually the departments of medicine. So, so patients with these diseases usually come to a speciality, and they are based, treated based on a symptom, a clinical symptom-based uh, um, uh, a based approach, which is actually uh, more and more an old-fashioned approach, I think, which has to be overcome. Why I say that? Uh, because uh, what we have learned is that, that we have in our hands nowadays a multitude of uh, targeted immune interventions, as you see them here, usually targeting different cytokines, but also mechanisms of the adaptive immune system. And actually, we learned about the diseases from these uh, therapies. So there's actually a complete reverse translation Prediction for many men models were 90% uh, wrong, and actually clinical studies told us how these diseases actually work. And the result of this is actually two learning things. One is that uh, there can be a very different appearance of, appearance of a disease uh, in one or the other organ, like this coffee machine and the car, but they are actually fueled by the same principle, by the same cytokine. And the other learning point is that there are, could be very similar looking disease, for instance, uh, affecting one organ, but they are basically fueled by completely different cytokines. And uh, based on this, uh, re uh, these lessons, you basically now could, and in textbook you still don't find it, you could go for a mechanistic, uh, uh, for a mechanistic molecular driven uh, tree of uh, these inflammatory diseases, which are pathway oriented. And you can see all these colors are now intermingled because actually pathways do not look so much for organs. They, uh, they drive a process in different organs. And I think that is what we learned also from cancer very much. Uh, and this is now also in inflammation that you basically look for molecular uh, patterns of pathology uh, which are uh, driving disease process. So where does the field move? Actually, it moves in, in whole medicine now from a, from a more symptom or, 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 or clinical pattern to a molecular pattern. A typical example is breast cancer, which is the, the standard nomenclature, but you now can also speak about, for instance, her 2 noi positive cancer, because it's also cancers in the stomach and in the ovaries, uh, which are HER2 positive. And you have a common principle, uh, the epidemial growth factor type 2, which you can target with trastuzumab. So trastuzumab does not only work in, in breast cancer. Same for CML. CML is uh, known to be Philadelphia uh, chromosome positive tumor, but also others are positive, like gastrointestinal stroma tumors or mastocytosis, for instance. 
And uh, there is a common mutation, PCR-able mutation, which you can target with imatinib, for instance. But this, is, this concept also now translates more and more to immune-made inflammatory disease. A classical example is Ormond's disease, rare disease, which is an aortitis of the abdominal aorta. Uh, and it's now known that it's actually an IgG4-mediated disease and many other diseases which were in the textbook that were not known by the actually uh, how they work. For instance, uh, thyroiditis, certain forms of thyroiditis and certain forms of pancreatitis, not the alcohol-induced uh, pancreatitis, actually all related to this IgG4, and we now speak about, uh, for, uh, we, we label this IgG4 syndrome, and we have a common pathology which we can target now with an uh, adaptive uh, immune intervention targeting, for instance, B cells. So there's an enormous flow nowadays in inflammatory medicine towards a molecular uh, disease um, uh, nomenclature. It all has been instigated by cytokine targeting, and TNF uh, targeting is actually the, um, the prototype of, uh, of a successful um, treatment of inflammation, modern treatment of inflammation. And it was quite interesting that TNF targeting actually targeted several different diseases, so it's basically a kind of a key fuel for several inflammatory diseases in the eye, in the spine, in the gut, and, in the, uh, and also in the skin. But we should not think that it works for everything. And uh, this is shown here. We, we usually consider glucocorticoid, for instance, work for every, any kind of inflammation. And the same is for TNF inhibitors. But that's not true. When you look at different inflammatory diseases, yes, you can find them where both work, uh, uh, like, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis. But you can see diseases which are actually inflammatory diseases which are not glucocorticoid responsive, like psoriasis, which are very TNF responsive. Uh, while there are diseases like asthma, which are very glucocortic res responsive, but not anti-TNF responsive. So you can see that there's a very distinct, actually, uh, responsive, uh, responsive of the different auto, uh, in inflammatory diseases uh, towards therapy. What is also important that cytokine biology in the last uh, decades ha has, has learned why inflammatory diseases are creating uh, pain, why they uh, create depression, because cytokines bind to peripheral neur neurons and elicit a, a stimulation of the brain, not only at somatosensoric er um, areas, but also at the limbic system, uh, which actually can now be interfered very well uh, with uh, cytokine inhibition. We call it also the feeling better effect uh, of uh, certain drugs, which I think we don't understand that well, but it's a clue to understanding better these diseases. Uh, with more modern um, uh, anti-cytokine blockers, and you see here a list of them, you can see that you even uh, are now much better in fingerprinting different um, uh, inflammatory diseases. And you can, for instance, see uh, even in a certain cluster of diseases, the eye is only responsive to TNF blockade, the gut to TNF and IL-23 blockade, the spine for TNF and IL-17 blockade, and the skin for all of the three, while, for instance, IL-6 and IL-1 blockade does not work in any of them. So you basically, with your therapy, you can fingerprint diseases, and you allow, basically, a new understanding of these uh, kind of condition. And even within a certain uh, organ, like uh, in the joint, uh, you can see that there is actually a very differential responsiveness to classical drug, but also to the newer drugs. The only one is TNF inhibition, which is actually working in all of them. But look at these ones, actually, very different responsiveness to uh, certain cytokine inhibitors. So basically, these, uh, these experiments, uh, these human experiences, teach us how um, uh, immune-made inflammatory diseases work. What is the challenge? Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge is that we have a ceiling effect. We are in the, in the good condition, in the perfect condition that we have many drugs, but we have uh, these drugs actually only tackle a, um, a, a certain proportion of the patient, and you can see uh, none of them are actually going to 100%. They, they tackle more or less 50% of the patient are going to get better. And this is a challenge for the development of new drugs. Because, for instance, one example, this is a, a, a cytokine inhibitor against GM-CSF, which is a key molecule to attract neutrophils and macrophages, which is obviously very important in uh, inflammatory diseases. But you can see when this is tested against the TNF blocker, it's here, the TNF blocker, and this is actually the, uh, the, the blocker of anti-GM-CSF, and this is a response uh, in arthritis, you can see that this drug is actually worse than a TNF blocker, or at least not better. 
So the, the company basically are discouraged to continue this drug. Although it's actually a very good drug, we would, be, would have been perfectly fine if we would have had this drug 20 years ago. So this is a challenge for new drug development. It needs a better stratification of the disease away from a, uh, from a just phenomenology towards a molecular-driven uh, disease uh, phenotyping. So this has been shown before, and it's the same principle. What we usually do nowadays in the clinics, we lump together a different patient with a different, basically, clinical presentation, but we don't accept, actually, that these patients are very heterogeneous, and based on the, uh, on the, on the molecular pattern, you have different endotypes of a disease, with probably a very different response uh, to treatment. And actually, what we are doing, we don't do precision medicine nowadays. We do imprecision medicine. What you see here are the most, uh, are the best sold drug in the United States. And you, you can see only in the blue uh, 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 figures, actually, the drug worked. And in all of the red, the, the drug did not work, uh, which is uh, sometimes going to one out of ten, 20. Uh, in this field of inflammatory medicine, is still one out, one out, of four, out, of, out of four, which is actually not very good. And why is that? I think uh, the, the, the main reason is that the condition and the diseases today are defined on clinical symptoms rather than underlying molecular and cellular events. So how to approach that? I think what we, what we lack is a better, uh, a better analysis of the tissue, of inflammatory tissue. And there are several approaches now underway to, uh, to make this uh, situation better. For instance, this is a STRAP study which is done in the UK where pa pa patients are actually phenotyped based on the, uh, on the molecular pathology in the joints and then uh, are subjected to different kind of treatments. And you can see that first results of this approach are actually quite encouraging. Uh, you can basically basically subtize, endo, you find endotypes of the disease, lymphoid-driven rheumatoid arthritis, myeloid-driven rheumatoid arthritis, fibroid rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see uh, response to therapy, to classical therapies, actually, um, uh, especially in this subset, lymphoid-driven disease, while in this su subset, actually not that good. And uh, that allows, actually, further room for better drug development and further improvement of disease classification. Well, I want to share with you three uh, examples where actually the field, where are the frontiers of the field. One frontier of the field is understanding master players um, of the reprogramming of cells. Because in an inflammatory tissue, over the time, cells reprogram. They change their phenotype completely. And to understand these master switches are extremely is extremely important. Why? Because it, this is actually an inflammatory uh, uh, feature of, a, uh, of a, a disease. And this is a chronic feature. And what you see, this is in the lung, in the liver, in the kidney, in different organs. And you can see here fibroblast resident cells. So here they are inflammatory, but here they, they start to make tissue damage, scarring of tissue, which is very bad because you cannot overcome this and you get a, a damage in the involved organ. And you can see here one of the master control factors is PU1, which is a transcription factor, uh, controlling actually this, uh, this reprogramming of the fibroblast in different uh, uh, chronic inflammatory tissues. And this is basically uh, based on the, on the effect of TGF beta, chronic TGF beta stimulation, which then induces PU1. And and starts actually this, uh, the reprogramming of these fibroblasts, starting to produce extracellular matrix, which is required for the scarring uh, of the tissue and which starts actually uh, the, the organ dysfunction. Second example is actually uh, that we still don't understand uh, the tissue, how the tissue works and the tissue is composed. This is an example how you can overcome this with modern imaging. This is light sheet microscopy of a joint and with reporter mice. And you can see this red membrane here, which is actually the synovial membrane. And people never understood how, what is the surface actually of the synovial membrane. These are macrophages. These are rex resident macrophages actually, which are there to clean the joint because we could not walk away from a mammoth in the Stone Age if our joints would be full of, of cells, if we would have been arthritis. So it's an immune-privileged site, the joint, which is, uh, which is uh, related to macrophage function. And we better understand with single, uh, single mRNA sequencing now that mac different macrophage populations are in the joint, and these macrophage populations are not only bad, they can actually also basically uh, overcome inflammation, and these, especially these resident macrophages, which you see here as lining macrophage, when you deplete them, you have even more arthritis. So these, uh, to understand, the, uh, to basically map the tissue uh, for, uh, for cells and for cell phenotypes, 
sites and for cell expression we allow us to much better understand the diseases. And the third example is that we still have no cure of the disease. It's like in HIV. What we do is good suppression of the disease. We make, sm we make an act active disease to a smoldering disease. When we stop therapy, autoimmunity actually triggers the relapse. And this is a, actually a big challenge because we, at the moment we have very, little to very few tools uh, to overcome autoimmunity, which is actually driving always the disease. And there are now different approaches going on to induce tolerance by combined beat and T cell, uh, uh, cell inhibition in these kind of diseases. So to sum up this, uh, uh, these, uh, these frontiers, first where we are at the moment, I think we, are, we, we understand there are dis distinct cytokine profiles in individual immune-mediated immune inflammatory diseases across the organs. So actually the organs move, to get, move closer nowadays. There is a molecular rather than a clinical disease a classification necessary in the future. We, and this will allow actually to create more mechanistically based treatment approaches, more precision medicine uh, type approaches. And finally, uh, there, uh, what we need is actually a, a molecular and functional characterizations of the cells in the inflammatory tissues. And that reflects very nicely what we have heard uh, in Alzheimer's disease and in other kind of, uh, uh, in other kind of conditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful overview. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, which I think is very relevant for um, many other um, areas. And I think um, extensive cross-collaboration will be necessary to tackle these challenges. I have a question about um, inflammatory uh, memory. You talked about switches. Do we know anything about um, epigenetic mechanisms um, when, uh, let's say, a tissue that is inflamed is not the same before and, um, and so forth. Yeah, you raise a very important point. So there is, uh, there, there is always the question why there is so much chronicity. And one is uh, obviously autoimmunity, but that's not the only reason, because you don't have always antibody in, t in diseases. So one is a, a epigenetic reprogramming. And actually, PU PU1 is typically epigenetically reprogrammed. Uh, so basically allowing to a, a, a phenotype, a stable phenotype, which is associated with chronic inflammation. But also there are other immune-driven uh, memory, uh, uh, like I mean, there is immune training, uh, Leo and Mihai are doing that very much, or also, the, or also memory T cells, which are then in the, in the tissue, even in the tissue of diseases which is in remission, they stay there, they are long-lived, and then can re-trigger disease at the same spot where it has been before. So these are the key, uh, the, the key points. We have to under, better understand the cellular composition, molecular composition of the tissue, also in remission stages, to judge why there is actually this high rate of relapse when you stop the treatment. Great points, thank you. Super nice talk. Can I first say this session is mind-blowing. Like really, this is what Lifetime is all about, and I really thank all speakers for this. Um, so we've had discussions on organoids versus mouse models versus better clinical data and so on. So you just showed joint inflammation. So I, I guess you have the people when they already have joint inflammation in the clinic, right? So what is your view on, on how we can feed better data to the bioinformaticians and so on on this particular disease? So how do we do this in vitro with an organoid? Do we do, like Bartos Stopper point about human cells into, into mouse models was also very, very nice. So, so what is your view on this? Yeah, I think uh, organoids and uh, all kind of in vitro experiment help. Yeah, but at the end, what you what you what you need is also an in vivo, basically tissue collection and uh, and to basically set uh, uh, characterize the actual state in vivo in the tissue. And this is more and more possible because. Many of the organs are actually easy biopsible, like the skin and the gut, and, but also the joints are now easily accessible. Organoids can help us if we have a certain, uh, we, when we know the cell and we suspect the mechanism, for instance, typically an ex example of organoid impl uh, implementation in uh, inflammatory medicine is, uh, is uh, um, um, it's gut organoids, where you basically can test how certain mechanisms work on epithelial homeostasis, uh, which is very nice, so that gives you a mechanism mechanistic view, which is sometimes hard to get in vivo in the, in, the, in the human situation. So I think it's always a puzzle. You need an in vivo, actually, biopsy, and then you need, actually, then also an in vitro validation, so to better understand the diseases. Yeah? So it's, it's not only one um, 
technique which is actually solving everything. So you need always the combination of several, and ideally you have similar results. That's then the best uh, validation. Yeah, fantastic talk, Your. Just to make sim uh, things even more complicated, I, I fully agree with you that we need pathophysiology and mechanistic uh, um, definition of disease. On, on the other hand, just to should we not put together actually the old knowledge and the new law knowledge, because maybe AL17 or TNF, to give some examples, might work different in different organs. So in fact, we would need, let's say, uh, to take care of both the mic microenvironment of a certain organ and the pathophysiology of that immune mechanistic uh, disease. So to yeah, Mihai, I fully agree, and a very nice example is, for instance, that people always thought that 23, IL-23 and IL-17 are the same. Yeah? But uh, the production is uh, very tissue dependent. Yeah? So 17 production can be 23 driven when there are a lot of uh, dendritic cells around, but it can be completely independent of 23 when there are no dendritic cells around. So, so the, the, the resident tissue composition is extremely important uh, how cytokines are produced and probably are also relevant then for different organ uh, responses in inflammatory disease. You're absolutely right. All right, last one. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, it was really beautiful. Um, so I was just wondering whether uh, you're thinking about looking at endogenous retroviruses in the inflamed tissue, how retrotransposon are uh, regulated, are they still uh, you know, under repression or they, uh, they are active there? Because they can be also a source of inflammation. Yeah, you're right. I'm definitely not an, ex an expert on retrotransposons, and I know a little bit of the literature. Some of the arthritis work are, um, is suggested that actually this, this synovial um, hypertrophy, the, the, this proliferation of resident tissue, which is uh, uh, in, a, in a junction to inflammation, is, uh, is retrotransposon L1 driven, for instance. So there are some concepts here, but they are there's their, lim their elaboration is, I would say, limited so far. So there's still enormous room for better understanding there. So there's limited data on them. I believe they play a role, but, um, as, but I'm not the, the super expert on them, I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much.